Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here's where I get to dive into deep storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and what drives them. Today, I connect with a deep wealth of knowledge, talent, drive, and maybe most important of all, purpose. Chef Rick Bayless was born on November 23rd, 1953 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, into a family of restaurateurs and grocers uh, specializing in the local barbecue. Having begun his culinary talent uh, training as a youth, Bayless broadened his interest in uh, to include regional Mexican cooking as an undergraduate student of Spanish and Latin American culture. After finishing his undergraduate education at the University of Oklahoma, he obtained his master's degree in linguistics at the University of Michigan. He had nearly completed a PhD in anthropological linguistics of Michigan when he decided to leave his studies to concentrate on his budding cooking career. While at Michigan, he met his future wife and frequently uh, and frequent uh, culinary collaborator, Deanne. They married in 1979. Before opening his own restaurant, uh, Bayless began his career as a professional chef in 1980 as the executive chef of Lopez y Gonzalez in Cleveland, Ohio, Ohio. In 1987, uh, Rick and his wife Deanna opened Frontera Grill in Chicago, specializing in contemporary regional Mexican cuisine with special emphasis on the various cuisines of the Oaxacan region, a region of Mexico that I'm deeply in love with. In 1989, Rick and Deanna opened Topo Bombo, one of Chicago's first fine dining Mexican restaurants. And as of 2019, uh, Topla Bombo has one Michelin star, which is outstanding. In 1995, Rick and partners started the Frontera Foods line of prepared food products. They sold Frontera Foods to ConAgra Foods in 2016. He remains involved as a product development advisor to the brand. He's one of the founding members of Chef Collaborative in support of, in support of the environmentally sound agriculture practices and is active in Share Our Strength, the nation's largest hunger advocacy organization. Often his TV shows emphasize responsible use of foodstuffs with focus on sustainable farming and cooking. Rick Bayless is a restaurant consultant and teaches authentic Mexican cooking throughout the United States. He's a visiting staff member at the Culinary Institute of America and leads cooking and cultural tours to Mexico. Fluent in Spanish, uh, Bayless uh, flavors coastal seafood fare and dishes that feature very traditional Mexican and pre-Columbian Incan, Mayan, Aztecian ingredients native to Mexico like chocolate peppers and vanilla bean. Bayless and his staff also began the Frontera Farmer Foundation in 2003. This foundation was set up to support Chicago area farm, local farmers by offering capital improvement grants. And as of 2017, more than $400,000 have been given to local farm, uh, family farms. In 2008, uh, Rick was widely considered to be serious contender for the position of the White House executive chef under the administration of Barack Obama. And, uh, like um, uh, Jacques Pepin, he declined. <laughs> Bayless was uh, a guest chef for May 9, 2010 White House state dinners honoring Mexican President, President Felipe Calderon and his wife Margarita Zavella. But most people know Rick Bayless from the winning the title of Bravo's Top Chef Masters, crushing the world-class competition with his authentic Mexican cuisine. <laughs> his highly rated uh, Emmy-nominated public television series, Mexico, One Plate at a Time, is broadcast coast to coast, and his nine cookbooks have earned multiple high-profile accolades, two of which you should be able to see behind me. Located in Chicago, Rick's Frontera Grill and Topla Bombo have each received the outstanding restaurant designation from the James Beard Foundation, an unprecedented feat for side-by-side -side restaurants. His widely popular fast casual Chocho has been drawing big crowds since 2009 and Tortas Frontera at Chicago's O'Hare Airport has changed the face of airport dining for good. And we all know that it's hard to find good food in airports. 2016, he opened Frontera Cochina in Disney Springs. In 2018, Rick opened bar Sotano, a Oaxacan-inspired Mexican bar with modern Mexican food in the basement of Frontera Grill. Also in 2018, he'd opened Tortazo. If I, ask, I think you're all getting it. Uh, Rick is a very prolific uh, guy. He's a, like, this goes on too long, Rick. I have to slow. I have yeah. to cut it short and talk to you in a second. So anyway, you're rushing. You're all all of these accolades, and I mean, you're you you in education. 
in, in, in research, in implementation, and bringing it all together. You're a nice guy. You know, I, I just wanted to hear your backstory when you started at a young age and when, you know, you're obviously real smart. And, and, but when did, when did food take you and, and where did you go with it? You know, I grew up in a family of restaurateurs um, and food was a major part of my growing up. Uh, I loved the kitchen and I loved the professional kitchen. So from the time I was about six or seven, I was asking to spend time in our family's restaurant every weekend. I would go out there and spend Saturday. Um, and I, I, th nobody ever made it seem like I didn't belong in the kitchen. Like I, a lot of people would have said, oh no, it's too dangerous to be in the kitchen. And there's knives, there's heat, there's all that sort of stuff. And no one treated me like that. Everyone said, you know, just the, here's the knives. So watch out for those guys. The stove is on, so it's gonna be hot. And I used to go into the walk-in and um, steal from everyone's mise en place and make up things and we hate, i we hated you. i loved that um it, it was like my thing and almost everything when i was little like that almost everything had melted cheese on it because then i could like layer things and stick them in the oven and then go and get them and i said i feel like that i was born with a pair of tongs in my hand because from the time from my earliest memories i was always cooking with a pair of tongs in my hand and even as a little kid, I would grab things out of the oven with a pair of tongs. So um, I, I, I will say that I always had a natural inclination to be in the kitchen. And then my grandmother was a really great, I, I would say she was more of a hostess than she was a, a great cook. But whatever, whenever you sat down to her table, she would tell you why, what you were going to eat was like the best thing in the whole wide world. Right. And I loved that because she made everything into something great. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I have no idea if it tasted that good or not, but <laughs> she convinced you that it was just absolutely delicious. From the back so I, It was, it, and you know, I grew up in, in Oklahoma, which is kind of a strange intersection between um, Texas, the Southwest, and the South. Well, and, and the plain states too. And it's that sort of no man's land that has a little influence from a lot of different places. So I grew up eating a lot of uh, Tex-Mex food, not New Mexico style food, but Tex-Mex food. And then I had family members that had come from the South. So we had really Southern cooking. And then I had all these people that came from the Plains states. My, you know, Oklahoma territory was opened up at, in a land run in 1889. And um, if you were a uh, homesteader, you could, you know, go in there and stake out a certain number of acres. And if you lived on those, that acreage for, I think it was like three or four years, yes. then you got the deed to it. And so my great grandmother came in the land run. She was a kid at that time, but she came in the land run, but she came from Kansas. And then on the other side of the family, everybody came from Arkansas and Mississippi. And so um, I got a lot of different influences. Um, certainly no, nothing Northern where I live now, but it was, uh, it, I, I grew up in a family that really built all of the, the family events and celebrations around food. And because I was in our restaurant all the time, and actually my mother, who never really cooked much when I was growing up, she had three or four dishes that she would make, but um, we would do takeout from our, our family's barbecue restaurant all the time. We would eat that. And then when I was working, when I would go to the restaurant, of course, I would eat there. So I, I really feel like that I grew up with a, a really strong, strong sense of food. And <clears throat> when I decided to sort of go another direction, I want and to get ask away you, I just want to food, ask you a quick question. Though, yeah, sure, sure. You just implanted this fantasy in my head of you growing up. Was, was there a lot of uh, like, you know, live fuel being used in, in, in cooking? Was there a lot of wood burning? Was there a lot of that, you know, outdoor really connecting with it all feel? 
Well, I, yeah, I grew up in a in a restaurant that only cooked over wood. Yeah. Um, they, they, the big pit was wood fired pit. My father designed a gas assisted one to help with uh, regulating temperature, mm -hmm. and he did it in a um, in a four door refrigerator. You know, the kind of the the old style four door refrigerators. Sure. Yep. Um, and so he took one of those and converted it into uh, his pit when they, they expanded the restaurant some and he built that. He had the original pit, um, which is actually still there though. We don't own that restaurant anymore. It's not even a restaurant. It's a, just a catering facility, but that pit is still there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was built of red brick. And so that was what um, we cooked in all the time until he built this other one. And um, everything that we had in our house smelled like hickory smoke. And when I got to puberty and all of a sudden uh, decided that I, I wanted to impress the girls in seventh grade or whatever it was, <laughs> um, I, I would keep separate shirts in the front hall, the front hall closet away from everything else I owned Sweet so smell. that they didn't <laughs> smell like hickory smoke. So old I, spice, I, man. <laughs> it, was, it was more than old spice. It was very definitely a, a a smell that you can't really. I mean, people would just say, like, "Did you just come from a campfire?" But it was really beautiful. It's that sweet smoke of hickory, which I to this day absolutely love. So that's oh. what I grew up. I grew up smelling like hickory. Smoke. So, so you satisfied my fantasy, and I want to thank you yeah. for indulging me. Sure, you sure, can continue. Sure. You can take yeah, well, it to, I would, <laughs> take it I, to the city. <laughs> I was just going to just say that I, I had decided that I had fallen in love with Mexico when I was, um, well, I would actually fallen in love with foreign culture when I was younger. And <clears throat> I decided that when I was 14, that I was going to plan a family vacation to Mexico. And um, I, I did it. I planned the entire thing and convinced my parents to go. And uh, so we went for a week that we never had anything more than a week for vacation because we closed our restaurant for one week a year and then we wow. would go away. And so I, we, I planned this, this visit to Mexico City and um, it was uh, it just changed my life. And I, I got to Mexico City and I thought, oh, my God, I feel so at home here. This is where I want to be. So rich so I in went, history. Yeah. The history is so ridiculous. It's, um, it's amazing. And, yeah. and that's what I, I loved. And so I ended up going back there every year during high school, like on school trips and stuff, and um, ended up going to college to study Spanish, Latin American culture. And um and I wanted, I decided I wanted to go that direction and really stay in academics. And that's why when I went into, um, I went to University of Michigan and studied and studied linguistics and anthropology and thought that that's what I was going to do. And then sort of like everything in my life changed in in three months when I was after I had finished all of my studies from my PhD and I was starting to work on my dissertation like literally everything just my whole life was in a complete upheaval and I had already started teaching some cooking classes at a local cookware shop uh, just because I loved doing it um, while I was studying and it gave me a completely different thing to do and I I, I was so enamored with doing that i just decided okay you, i'm just going to take a year off from my my studies and i'm going to go i'm going to just go deeply into this and see if i like it and i never looked back <laughs> and i never finished the phd i just decided i was going to go into the food world and i loved i started a small catering company with a friend of mine and you know everything um sort of started falling into place and um the odd thing is um, I, when I listen to you read, read in there my biography, it's like I, I, I've always loved to do a lot of different things, and I think it sort of comes through yeah. in that. But um, <laughs> here I was, uh, this guy. What nobody really believes is that I, I was doing. I was in pastry, um, and all I did in those first few years of oh, getting I saw your PTVA, the, by the way, look great. My PTVA. Yeah. No, I haven't made stuff. one in, I haven't made one in 40 years. No, your social and, media presence is awesome, by the way. I, I oh, just thank want you. everybody I love, listening to make sure they follow you because you're fantastic. Well, 
Thank you very much. But I, anyway, I was teaching pastry and that was really my specialty. And um, somebody asked me, they said, but you lived in Mexico for a while when you were an undergraduate. So teach us Mexican food. And so I took that as a sort of challenge. And I started, I didn't know hardly anything about Mexican food, but I knew how to study. And so I started studying and studying and studying. And then one thing led to another, to another. And I got this this television series on public television. We were talking back in 1977. Um, I got this series um, that was produced by a small um, channel in, in Ohio, at Bowling Green, Ohio. And um, they said they were looking for somebody to teach um, because they have a huge uh, immigrant population and they had, they had actually, they, they were all people that used to work migrantly and they had settled in the area and they found this woman who was just a really big personality and she wanted to do this, uh, her cooking class, her cooking show and share from the immigrant community to the community at large, uh, what, what life was like in the kitchen uh, for Mexican immigrants. And um, she, they had it all set up and she backed out literally at the last minute and they, they called me and they said, because they knew I was teaching Mexican food and that I had some background in it. And they said, uh, would you consider doing this? And I took a really deep swallow because <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. And um, I pretty much spent the next three months just, I, I went to Mexico, I traveled all around Mexico. I, I put together my, my stuff, I tested recipes and everything. And then that really started me down the path of doing Mexican food. Yes, I had some background in it, but not seriously. And um, so this, that really did. And that was uh, distributed all over the United States. This is long before Food Network and such like that. Um, and it got picked up by lots and lots of public television stations. And then they said they had money for a second series, a second year, uh, mm -hmm. a second year of it. And so they, we did a second when I went back to Mexico, I traveled all around and did all this research there, came back, put together another series of shows. And literally we shot those shows with um, three students on cameras and my my partner from my my uh, catering business, uh, she came and helped me uh, just do all the prep. We washed all the dishes. We did everything ourselves. It was kind of crazy, but I wouldn't trade those days for anything. You but that's own, how I got started. Do you own those that footage, all of that that, that the stuff back then? We do you own it? we do. We have them here, but there I don't. We would really have to search long and hard for a device that could read them because they're on this. Them this tape oh you know you don't i yes i, I do that I have more than ever now that i know you oh yeah, you kidding right. me i'll be oh i gotta have a <laughs> you gotta see it when was, people um, started out <laughs> oh it's kind of embarrassing but they were all shot <laughs> they were all shot live to tape meaning that literally when the director said you know okay uh, action then I had 22 minutes and 30 seconds to finish what I usually did three dishes in that 22 minutes and 30 seconds. I had to talk the whole time and talk, tell stories and cook and keep everything, you know, going and all that sort of stuff. And I did, um, yeah, I did 26 shows in that, that third, that series, I did 13 each year. And I will tell you that was, it was great, great experience. Yeah, man. So go on, go on. This is good. Didn't well, you? I'm, you know, I, I would just say that that kind of got me started in that direction. And I kind of never looked back after that. But my idea after doing all that research in Mexico, like serious food research was to move to Mexico. And so um, my wife and I, we gotten married in 79. And we we moved to Mexico. I, I went, I did a couple stints other places but then we had, we saved up all of our money and we're in mexico what part of mexico and we so moved to mexico city Got um it. that's a really really good place to learn about regional cuisine because you can find every region there but mm -hmm. during the time that we the five years that we were in mexico and i know it sounds like that we were in you know independently rich or something like that we weren't we didn't have any money at all but we got this part-time gig um working in los angeles for a chain of mexican-american restaurants i mean serving the kind of food that 
I always rail against because it's not Mexican food, it's Mexican American food. Right. But they offered me this really lucrative job where I could be, I could work for a few weeks developing dishes for them and helping them standardize things. It was a small chain that was trying to grow to a larger chain. And um, so that I was helping them to do that just by regularizing things and coming up <laughs> with these. I said they had 27 ingredients in the kitchen and I had to cook out of those 27 ingredients oh, yeah. all the That's time. It. And new new things from that. And it's like, okay, at some point you're going to reach the limit here. Can't I have one more ingredient so that I can do <laughs> something else? So um, I that that was actually a really good gig for us. And my wife, um, after the first a few weeks that we were there, um, because she had a background in computers, and remember in those days it wouldn't very few people had that. Right. And um, so she she found a job for herself. So we would work there for a few weeks, and then we would be off for a few months. And we literally sort of lived hand to mouth, but we could make enough in those few weeks of working for them to be be able to do the research that we wanted. And we thought that that research was going to take us about a year to do all that I wanted to do and then have material to write a book. And it ended up taking five years. So we did that for five years. Mm -hmm. And wow. out of that, it just really, um, out of that came our first book after we turned that in. Um, that we, we turned it in in 85 and then tried to figure out what we were going to do. I, uh, we were still working for that uh, small chain of restaurants in Los Angeles, but we had moved to Chicago by that point because we needed to settle here and do something. And we decided that we didn't like living in Los Angeles very much. Um, and and the, the real reason was, is that I, I sort of had in the back of my mind that I, I might want to open a restaurant and I trying to do, trying to do like food from Oaxaca and such in, in, in Los Angeles at that time, um, there was such a strong Mexican American, Southern California idea yeah. of what it's different now, but it wasn't then. And yeah, there were it was, a, it was few a tough small that was places. a tough barrier to break through, I would imagine. They were so and thick just, into what they wanted. They knew what they wanted and it wasn't authentic, but that's what they wanted. You you were like that's ah. what they wanted. And they really thought that when you would ask them, you know, it was this Mexican food, they would go, that's not Mexican food. You can't call that Mexican food. And yet it was the food that people was eat, were eating in Mexico. So um, and we had done part of what I, I did for that company was to do customer surveys and see what they and I thought, there's no way I can work with this customer base and try to do the food that was going to make me really happy. Yeah, yeah. So um, so we decided to settle in Chicago because um, it, it, we, there's a really large um, Mexican population here. You know, we're the first city in the United States to be a third a, a third Latino, a third black and a third white. Um, and so we, we live in this really, really large Latino population and almost almost all of it is from Mexico. And so you can be in neighborhoods here that feel just like you're in Mexico. Yeah. And I decided for the one reason that I wanted to settle in Chicago was because of that population. And the other was because I wanted to settle someplace where we had some family and this is where Deanne was born and raised. And so I wanted to be able to be, and, and that's really stood us in very good stead through the years. Plus I like, I like the Midwestern mentality. I, I like the, the fact that if you do a good job and you offer offer good food at a reasonable price, you don't have to reinvent yourself every three years. Like in Los Angeles, it seemed like restaurants went in and out all the time. And uh, there were some long standing ones, but most of the ones that were really you know, sort of cool <laughs> were not, the, not those. And, and, and I just didn't, I wanted to go to a place where I could feel like I could put down roots. And that's why um, I love Chicago. And do, you know, that we are just now celebrating our 34th anniversary here. Congratulations, and that's amazing, I'm, truly. I, mean I, I cannot even imagine, except that I have a goal. So my parents' barbecue restaurant lasted for 37 years and my mother hit 65 and sold it. My father passed away long, long, long before that, but my mother ran it um, for all of those years. And 
um, she just finally got tired. And at 65, she decided she wanted to sell it and move on to something else. My mother, sort of like me, she would, was constantly reinventing herself and doing different <laughs> kinds of things. And my mother had gotten so in, she took up golf when she was 58. And that became her whole life. And she's, she was extremely competitive and um, won all kinds of tournaments and all that sort of stuff between the years of 58 and 70. So um, she, she really got into golf and at 65, she said, I wanna sell the restaurant. So she closed it after that, those years and sold it to somebody else um, who now runs it sort of as a catering kitchen. But um, one, one time, a few years, ago we went and knocked on the door and said can we just come in and reminisce and so we did and i that's why i know that the pit's still there everything is still there just the way that it was did she love it when she was doing it i think she was my mother's was very very she just passed away a, a couple of years ago uh, and she was very social and she was like this, the, this yeah. great personality in the restaurant. And people would just love to come and say hi to her. And she and, wins. And she wins. And she wins. She does. Yeah. And she, she really, loves. she loved all of that part of it because of being such a social person. And our food was very, very much of the people, you know, it wasn't fancy. We didn't try to do anything fancy, but everything was done from scratch, um, and, and, you know, as I was growing up, uh, there were all kinds of innovations that would be, would, would find their way into our back kitchen. And almost always they were re rejected by the staff because they said, no, we just like doing it all from scratch. And um, that made me really happy to have been raised in that kind of an atmosphere where just starting with natural ingredients and cooking those were, is, is really very rewarding. And oh, so man, I grew up with beautiful. that. I, and and once, once or twice a year, I create almost all of that menu um, from uh, here at my house in Chicago. And um, I even have a special kind of um, grill slash smoker that comes from Oklahoma that I cook the ribs in and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I do that for my friends and family here. And, and it's, it's part of our tradition. Well, you know, I've, I told you, you know, I got this man crush on you. I want to come up and cook with you someday. I want to, that would be I, great. I, I, I saw the, I saw that, uh, a chef's table with uh, Christina Martinez uh, doing barbacoa in South Philly. Right. And, you know, and the El Compadre, I think our restaurant is. And I just was like, so enamored with that. Yeah. You know, I want to do yeah. this. No, I just harvested a lamb the other day. You know, I, yeah, I saw those pictures. That's you know, very was, cool. No, I have to do these things. You know, it, that's what the pandemic has allowed me to do is to yeah. do the things that I said to myself, I don't have time to do that. I wish I had. I can. Now. Boy, I, I can't agree more. It's been like a, it's been a hard time for us. It's been the hardest year of my life, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, um, it, it, it allowed us as a restaurant to kind of push a pause button and say, okay, now who do we want to be? And, you know, what's important to us. And then mm -hmm. uh, obviously personally, we've done the same sort of thing and just spending so much more time in my house with my wife and, exactly. and doing stuff has been just incredibly wonderful. I feel like that, I said this to somebody the other day that I feel like I've been on this long, long, year long journey. Adventure. Far, far, far away. And now I'm just coming back because we're just opening up again. We're just starting to see diners coming back. And so we're, and we're, we're recreating our restaurants in a way that, I mean, it's hard, crazy to think about this, saying that at 34 years old, but we are doing we are recreating the restaurant the way that we want it to be right now and the way that we think it's going to be right for our guests so it's a it's a very special moment i think and as hard as it's been i i wouldn't i i wouldn't trade it honestly that, i know it's the hard those are words that are almost too hard for me to get out of my mouth because it's been really 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 hard but at the same time I feel like that I have learned so much. And so as all the people, I work with this amazing group of people, some of which have worked with me for almost 30 years now. So it's like, we all, we, we had each other's backs and we got through this as scared as we were and all of that. And we're now back to here on Clark street, our restaurants have about a couple hundred employees and 
we have four places. They're all stuck together. That's the kind of craziness of it. Yeah. But we have a couple hundred employees here and we're at 58% of that. But the, the other the other group, that sort of um, 42%, um, they've all left the industry. So now we're just like everybody else. We're, we're trying to, to hire people that we haven't worked with before, which is, you know, it's really hard. So that's the thing that we're, we're trying to get. I, don't, I had a long talk with all of our management staff yesterday about that, about, you know, how hard this last year has been. And now we are just going to face another hard year of it, but it's going to be different hard. And so we got to get ready for that. I have two questions for you, because I want to get off the topic of the pandemic, because it's going to... That you you can see the end of the tunnel. I really feel yep. it. Vaccinations yep. and everything. So we're going to be fantastic. I'm not worried about that. So I want to ask you a funny question. Popped into my head early on when you were talking. So now you have many restaurants, chef, and you have many people within there. So I don't know how many people are back of the house. But let's say one of those people in the back of the house were uh, you were setting yourself up to do a cooking demo, and someone went back there and stole some of your mise en place because they were so so excited about cooking. Would you would you be mad at them? <laughs> you did. Um, that's why. That's why you're not, you steal, yeah, right. you're stealing me some plus, brother. I'm pulling you out. Oh, on. So if they did it to God. you right now, I would. what would I, you do? Oh my! Be honest, gosh, that is so incredibly hilarious that you asked <laughs> me that question. Um, that I I'm not I'm not a, a person that gets gets mad very easily at all unless it's happened to me many times from the same person then yeah. I would get mad but um, if somebody took some of my mise en place um, I'm a scrambler I can I think that's why I did well on Top Chef Masters because I I'm a person that when something goes wrong then immediately my mind doesn't go to like why did that happen or who did that but how am I going to fix it right, I right. think that's a that's a pretty a pretty strong chef trait there um, <laughs> and I I I think I would not get terribly mad. Um, but I would immediately think about all the things that had to be done. We have a grocery store two blocks from our restaurant, so I'd be sending somebody really fast. <laughs> well, but the three-day process, you host. Yeah, oh, that's the, no, my, that would be that horrible. Yeah. Funny story for me, and that uh, you know, after Top Chef Masters, you won. You were, you were declared the Top Chef Master. The first <laughs> first season that they came up with it, which was insane. I was involved for twelve seconds. But they, people fell in love with me, and they called me back for the next year. But yes, I just you, know, you had to deal with Chiarello, and he is he's, he's the characters that you got you had to deal with. It must have been crazy. Yeah, well, but, but we, yeah, we we had we had some really really great people on that as totally. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like Anita Lowe, I hadn't gotten to spend very much time uh, with her. And so um, that was really nice to get to know her. And she's an amazing cook, super quiet, but uh, an amazing cook. And then, um, um, uh, 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 oh, Heller, what's his first name? All of a sudden, I can't remember. Thomas Uber. Keller? No. Uber no, Keller. Uber. 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 Oh, what a man. And Uber, you know, he, he was, it was Chiarello. Um, Keller and me at the end, the three right. of us, and right. and Uber is just an amazing technician. I mean, we all get to see Jacques Pepin cook all the time because he does so much TV stuff and all, mm -hmm. and and videos, and he's just the master of technique. But Uber is the same way. I mean, they both had the same kind of upbringing, and man, that guy can cook. He did, we had to do this one thing uh, where we had to prepare a buffet for a hundred people. And we got um, a couple of people to help us do it. Um, and he decided to do it, his whole thing as a brunch buffet. Mm -hmm. And it like at the end of the whole thing, all of us just wanted to walk away and just say, no, you bear, this is yours. <laughs> you, like, we had, none of us could even we're, come close to what he was doing. <laughs> I mean, it, everybody else looked like a just a rank amateur compared to what he was able to pull off in that amount of time. I, I was so incredibly blown away. So Food Network's in New York, in, in Las Vegas, and they're mm -hmm. looking for some, some uh, chefs that you know, have been on the show, et cetera, mm -hmm. to do the recipes of the winning recipe for the season, you know, and because, of, you know, let's face it, 
these they, no one really knows the recipe you know when they're, mm -hmm. they, they just see the chef running around spilling the, right, the, right 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 blender blows up ah, ha, ha, all, yeah. all the stuff you know so yeah. this is like I, I i was commissioned to do yours I, I you know i had to do a couple others and i remember doing the cochinita pibil and just going through the the recipe and and, and, and the, the all of the layers and everything that's it's something that I would love to actually do in a real pavil with yeah. wood, with the heat, with the banana leaves, with the real citrus. Because I you can't find uh, maybe you can. No, like the 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 the, the, citrus, the orange, the sour orange yes. in Mexico is right. is uh, is hard to find in the U.S. Right. So I want to do it. A real, I want to do it the real, real, real way. You know, to well, you'll own. have to you have to come up. I have a full on pit in my backyard yeah. to do that. I'm inviting <laughs> so, myself over your house. It's there. It's I'm a, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> let's do it. All right. It's now an the, all day. It's an all day affair. I usually start the pit um, about six in the morning and I burn I burn wood in it for about three or four hours and then it burns down to coals and then you put the whatever you're going to cook in it you put it in a vessel in that hot pit and then you seal it off completely so i have a, a rolled steel top that goes over the top of it yeah. and then pile on dirt all over because you can't let any um any oxygen get in there because you got to put that fire out really quick and then it just cooks from the the residual heat oh, and that is and such slow. a great thing like about six hours or seven hours and it's just amazing I did some lamb ribs the other day from the, the lamb I harvested last week, and they were uh -huh. cra crazy. Never, I'll yeah. never eat another lamb like that again in my life. You know, and that's just wow. the type of stuff. I have a serious you, question for you, though. You did that, but you did that there uh, near Vegas. Yeah, in my backyard. I got a beautiful oh, barbecue set up. I got a pizza oh, oven okay. in my backyard that I built. Nice. So I use the oven to roast uh, a leg of lamb and the head, uh -huh. the tet, you know. Yeah. And then I, uh, I, I made a marguez sausage from the shoulders. No, I'm nice. sorry. Yeah, from the shoulders, from and you know, pulled a lot of good meat for that. And then actually, no, the sh the neck meat is what I use for the Irish stew that I made for t uh, yesterday. You know, for right. now for Ron St. Patrick's. Yeah, okay. So anyway, here's my serious question too, and I'm and I and, I don't, and I'm sure you've had a lot to think about this because Mexican food, okay, because I'm gonna call it food in America, and that's the f food, the tacos, the tortillas, the uh, enchiladas, the things that everybody knows about you know yawn you know you know there's so much more uh to cuisine so everybody sees it's like chinese food it's cheap it's cheap it's for quick mexican food let's go get tacos we've got money we're you know we, we might be dusted we can get tacos so that's a mentality that's ingrained in most of america i would i would assume right and so that means you know you you, you can only get to us no matter how refined your food becomes and continue and is and go and goes beyond can, can you get can you get a fair dollar for it or do you still feel as though you're stuck under that stigma of Mexican food is cheap so why are you charging me more this is a very interesting question 34 years into this when we first opened it was just a barrage of stuff because we were we opened up Frontera as a sort of um nice not, we'll call it upscale casual mm -hmm. place you know no tablecloths and no tasting menus nothing like that right. and um we it, we put some touchstone dishes on the menu that people would relate to as mexican food and everything but we used really really good ingredients and we charged the same kind of prices that other upscale charge up, upscale casual places would charge okay and of course the we just got onslaught of complaints that it was too expensive for Mexican right. food. What if it, we, if it, it was another nationality, it would have been okay. But it's always supposed to be cheap if it's Mexican. It's a lot of what the Indian restaurants have to deal with too, you know, because of the Indian buffets and all that sort of stuff. And so you go think you can get a lot of food for cheap. Um, and so you would think that after 34 years that that had slowed down and, and it has. Um, partly because we've gotten lots of accolades and you know we're always included in best restaurants categories and stuff like that so what's so but it's still out there it's it's still out there and we're still doing exactly what we're doing in fact we have been you know two two and a half years after we opened frontera we opened topolobampo because I had this vision that we could we could bring the respect to the cuisine if we put it in the right setting. And there's all these really amazing restaurants in Mexico City that do high-end Mexican food. And I 
I wanted to be able to do that kind of a thing. And so we opened Temple of Bampo. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's always done really well. It usually grosses exactly the same as Frontera and they're side by side. But I will say that uh, the one thing that I hear mostly is that people, when I go past tables that you'll hear someone saying, this isn't really Mexican food. This ah. is just something that Bayless has created. And it's like, oh, my God, you know, I just want to stop <laughs> them right there and say, you have no idea what you're talking about. My goal is to, to feature the real cuisine of Mexico in all of its complexity. And some of the sauces take days to prepare. It's not right. like something that you just throw together. And um, so not like two hot tamales. That is <laughs> no. <laughs> Tamales are actually time consuming to make, though. That's one of the things. No, but anyway, oh, you're talking about those Susan that Tenegar call and, and, themselves yeah, the two hot hots. tamales. <laughs> yes. But anyway, we're, I will say that we're just, um, you know, we're, I think we're making a lot of progress in that, in that area. Um, and we have never swayed from our vision of bringing respect to this cuisine that I love so much. And, and you know, it doesn't, it, it shouldn't surprise anybody that growing up in barbecue, which is a regional cuisine, that I fell in love with the regional cuisines of Mexico and hardly anybody even knows them. I mean, when you say, when you say, Oh, you know, this is a, a really classic Veracruz dish. A lot of times people won't even know where Veracruz is. Or if you right. say, Oh, this is a real specialty from the state of Guerrero and that everybody, I mean, it's such a big deal in, in oh, Guerrero yeah. that on Thursday afternoons, most of the people take off work just to go eat it. Yeah. Um, and when you hear that sort of stuff, most people go, this is crazy. I, I just thought it was tacos, you know? And so we are making some headway. Um, we've never strayed from our vision of wanting to really celebrate the cuisines of, of Mexico. How do you get your check average then? You have to, I mean, it's a business. See, the, yeah. the, the, just to explain to the people that are listening, because you and I are obviously, we talk on a different level sometimes, is that there's, it, it's, it's, yeah, there's so much overhead. The, uh, the the insurance that you have to take out you're, you're if you don't you're you're in big trouble you know the, the 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 benefits and the payouts the payroll the purveyors the cost of the food the deliveries the fact that you can get avocados directly taken from uh, mexico because you have created a connection with them because the market right. in america it's it's commodity i mean at any given day yeah. a, a case of avocados could be just through the roof you know, you, but these are things that you've established, these relationships and everything over all these years, you know. And so, right. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to, um, to go to your restaurants and, and feel the love that you get to, you know, to deliver on a, on a consistent basis in a cuisine that is so, like, rich. I, I, I have a, a, a deep interest. In, that's going to be my new direction. I'm going to start to learn more about Mexico. I met my wife in Oaxaca while I was shooting a, uh, a pilot for a television show. She was, she was also part of the, the crew, and she, became, she had to be in charge of me. She was the stylist and everything. She made sure I looked good and everybody. They were taking it seriously, and we fell in love in Oaxaca. And I proposed oh. to her. I proposed to her in Punta Mita, you know, after a bottle yeah. of tequila. And the next morning, she actually had to ask me if I was serious. And I said, "Damn, we're all." <laughs> yes. So I got, I, I got a lot. Of, I, I have a ton of love with Mexico, and I'm gonna. Right. I need to find a time where you're not gonna be bugged, but I want to bug you and, and and extract as much of the the sure. love and research that you have done because I respect every single thing that you do. You know, it's the truth. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd be happy to share all that with you. Um, the, we, I spend a lot of time in Mexico city. I have an apartment in Mexico city. Yeah. And, um, I, the reason that I do that again, sort of going back to what I said at the beginning, that it's a place where you can find a little bit of everything. Right. And, you know, if you want to, if you want to eat really good Oaxacan food, you can find it in Mexico city. It's not going to be second rate. And so, um, I like to go there for that, but my, my heart really lies uh, with with Oaxaca, that's where I yeah. fell in love with Mexico so deeply. Yeah. And for the last thirty years, um, I've spent every Christmas in Oaxaca because it's the. If any of our listeners can go to Oaxaca at Christmas time for the twenty third 
and the 24th. Those two days in Oaxaca are just absolutely amazing. The 23rd is the Radish Festival, which is the biggest ephemeral art um, thing in the world where people carve these elaborate scenes out of these enormous radishes. Um, they're red on the outside, but they look like daikon radishes and they right. do all this really, really beautiful carving. And then on the 24th, it's like all, all the parish churches bring their floats down and the band, the church band down and they all parade around the Sokolo. And I, I've done that for 30 years straight, except for this last year when we didn't travel anywhere <laughs> at Christmas yeah, time, but yeah. I'll be back there next year. Well, I've been, I started off in Montauban to learn about the, you know, the, the culture of agriculture and how it began there pretty much mm -hmm. and how everybody, and this is on a billion years ago, and I'm not going to get the dates right. You, you're the historian on that, but people would go up there and they'd be in magic, um, the gigantic markets where everything was, it was a mercantile market. Everything got sold back and forth and in, 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 in uh, Montauban, you know, and I was in, I spent some time in the city of Oaxaca, went to uh, one of the, like a, a far, like a little, museum of all, all these uh, cacti that are growing and everything that's indigenous right to, right right that's a very region. cool place and, and and in each area had like a different color uh, soil under it so you can actually tell that this is not from this is from over there and right this is from here right you know and then you get to do a shot of mescal wire there and then you know i i flew over the the, the, the mountains over to the, the shoreline and, and you know, i yeah. got to spend some time in oh, what's it, what was it the like Huatulco or Puerto Escondido. Huatulco. Huatulco. Yeah. Went to the market. That is my, that, that flight that you just described is my favorite flight in the whole wide world. Because everything's smoking down below. And you ever you go up and you're you're not going up very high, but the mountains go cut will kind of come up to greet you, yeah. and then you just barely crest that that the mountains and you go right back down to the. But that that whole Sierra Madre Sur um, yeah. there is really tall. Like if you drive down to the coast, it takes you about anywhere from 11 to 12 hours. <laughs> but if you fly it, it's 45 minutes, well, a max 45 minutes. That's crazy. So, I mean, the, this podcast is sponsored by uh, Forever Oceans, a startup aquaculture company that's bringing products to uh, um, the market later this year. And their first product is going to be a, and this is a company that's doing things sustainably and properly. Uh -huh. you know, they're, they focus on nutrition, texture, you know, the animal, and right. fresh, all, uh, freshness is, you know, you don't assume that, of course, that freshness, but, but there's also texture in, in their feet and flavor in their feed and everything and the way they're doing it. They're farming this uh, kahala fish. It's, it's an amberjack for in, in, in uh, Hawaii. And I want to make sure I get you some to play with just for yourself, send them to your house. Oh, I like. would love it. Yeah. That's yeah. very and, cool. Um, so I just want to, I just want to get your in, in, input, your feelings about, you know, seafood and aquaculture and, Where's that? Where's that play in your life? And I and I'm not putting you on the spot. You could hate it. I, I'd love you to hate it. No. I could ask, then I could ask you why, and we can have a discussion. But I'll, yeah, seriously. I'm well, you're you're talking to somebody who actually loves it and promotes it all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we work with a whole lot of aquacultured fish. Um, but usually, one of the things that I like about aquaculture fish is that I can actually go to the farms and visit them and see what they're doing firsthand. Whereas if stuff is harvested out of the ocean, I don't know what that, I mean, in some cases I have gotten to know the fishermen that are fishing it, but most of the time we don't get to know the fishermen. We just know something about where it came from, perhaps the method that they used to harvest it with. But I will say that um, I love working consistently with um, a number of aquaculture farms because I've visited them and I love what they're doing. And I think it's just a pretty amazing thing that now it's aquaculture sort of started off and got a really bad reputation in terms of, mm -hmm. of its, its environmental um, of stuff. But now, now people are taking all that into consideration and doing good stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm really happy to, to uh, promote aquaculture, and I know the consistency of it. And if it's if it's badly aquacultured stuff, then I won't won't go for it. Or if it doesn't taste good, I won't go for it. Well, you keep yourself in great shape. I mean, I, I know that your yoga, you have a lot yeah. of you've got you've got a regime to keep yourself, you know, on top of your game so that you can think straight into what you do and you follow your passion. Would you be interested in uh, going out to uh, Hawaii and checking out the farm? from uh in, in in i don't know if you if you, if you could pull yeah. a few days out of your schedule and do that i'd like to invite you to 
come on board with a couple of chefs that I want to have come out to see if, uh, you know, this Kahala is the fish sure. is great. I got to work with it a couple of weeks ago. It's actually it's nice. nice. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. 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 yeah I, but, it, w which Island is it close to? I think it's a big island. I think it's, it's near yeah. Kona. You know, where yeah. there was Kona Kampachi out there. Right. The same waters. And the reason being it's, it's, you know, fish get to live where they choose, you know, and usually if they're yeah. congregating in one area, it's because the conditions are right for them to survive right, right. and thrive. For sure. So yeah. it's nine miles off the shore. So it's not uh -huh. being, um, you know, an overcrowding situation. And, 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 and you're, yeah. you can ask any question you want and you can learn more about it. And I think it'll be a fun uh, project, even for myself and as well as my, my, you know, my colleagues like yourself that might want to be interested in doing it. would love to have you come on. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you're Please, scuba Please, let's dive. talk about it. We'll scuba dive right down um, I, to this. I have never scuba dived in my life, but okay. I'm always up for a new adventure. So maybe if it's <laughs> uh, if it's enough in the future, I could get my certification. If you were on Top Chef Masters and he said you had to, you would. I know you would. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I think I've taken up uh, enough of your time today. Unless unless there's something else uh, that's on your mind that you want to, um, you know, promote, talk about, um, any of any any. Well, any you know, I did. I did 12 seasons of Mexico, one plate at a time. And I set that whole thing up to do, you know, that, well, I talked about that first series that I did a hundred years ago. Um, and I said, I would never go back to TV if I couldn't do something that was a lot on location. Um, but back in those days when I was doing that, that was never consideration at all. Right. And um, so then I did, uh, we started Mexico one plate at a time. And I said, I wanted ev for every show, I wanted half of it to be shot on location in Mexico. And then the other half in my kitchen at home. And that worked out really good. And we've done so many wonderful things and covered so much of Mexico and in depth. And um, so we're not sure we're going to continue on with that. But what I have started is that I, I realized that after 40 years, I have doing this stuff that I'd really created a massive wealth of material. So I started um, a YouTube channel a subscription channel that's called the complete Mexican kitchen series. And oh, wow. so I'm really having a lot of fun right now. And we are producing um, two or three videos every week. Um, and I am giving like out all of the knowledge that I have accumulated over in, over this time in small little snippets. And um, so I think it's going to be my best thing yet because it really is the culmination of a lot of, of work learning because I, I'm not one of those chefs. I, I, I like to be inventive, but I don't like to be inventive just to be inventive. Usually what I like to do is to um, take a really tried and true fundamental or what I would call a foundational recipe and then get creative within that recipe. Right. And that's what that's what I think is the best cooking. If it's something that evolves from a tradition, rather than just is a completely new dish that's never been done before. And so that's what we're talking about in this um, in this series is the do you really miss, do, you, do you demystify chilies because i feel that yeah chilies are so mislabeled it could be a local thing it's hey it's a california chili but does right. that mean it's a, you know and uh and because there are so many characters of flavor differential between completely the, the yes. chilies, and i know you understand that do you in, the, in this series uh help yes. to break it down we're so we get, very much so very so much so. i, I want to i want to i want to take the course but i, I just want to <laughs> give me a discount because i'm not really i'm, I'm kind of poor it's cheap okay i can handle it <laughs> <laughs> it's cheap it's a it's, it's 4.99 a month so oh, it's not, not expensive so okay, I'll just... anyway it's a it's a it's going to be a couple year project to get all this stuff uh, committed to video, but we're we're really having a good time. We're three or four months into it now. So oh, okay, so let us know when it goes live. You know, we'll. Uh, oh no, it's it. it's live now, but we're just adding to it every week. So, so what's it called? Yeah, it's called the Complete Mexican Kitchen Sessions. All right, I want everybody to remember that, and I just want you to remember okay. how much I love you. And I'm going to come to Chicago probably with some. Uh, some of the uh, top brass in my uh, the company I work with because we all love Mexican food. They're from Texas. They love Tex-Mex, but they like to learn more what's not how you can take something else and make it not so Tex-Mexy because you can you can make it more Mexy. Anyway, yeah. that's that's my that's my project on my own. I want to start to see how I can do that. And uh, we'll, you're you're welcome here anytime. Well, thank you, Rick. Let and, us and, know. 
thank you for your time and uh, certainly and uh, for everything that you do and uh I hope someday our paths will cross very, very soon. Me too. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me on, Rick. And I, it's, I agree. I would really like our paths to cross again real soon. They will, I promise. You take care now. You too. Bye. Foreveroceans.com. <laughs>